in downtown Peco Park, a new beginning. Let's go. Started back rocking the brown. Ever since we've been knocking them down. Knocking them down. Baby said she wanna go to the game. To the game. Taught her how to say Padre gang. Started back rocking the brown. Rockin the brown. Ever since we've been knocking them down. Knockin them down. Mitchell and Ness with the old school name. All of the homies holler Padre gang. Yeah. That's the and good day, everybody. Welcome to episode 176 of the Talking Friars podcast and YouTube show. I am your host, Ben Fadden. Today, we got a guest, Tim Haggerty. He's a broadcaster for the AAA El Paso affiliate of the Padres, the Chihuahuas. Uh, thank you so much, Tim, for joining the show. Thank you. Nice to meet you. I like that intro. That was cool. Yeah. So, all right. This episode, by the way, before we get started, we'll talk about Nomar Mazar. We'll talk about uh, Jose Castillo, Nelson Lamette a little bit, Ryan Weathers, touch on a lot of guys, obviously Abrams, guys like that. Uh, but this episode brought to you by Gaglione Bros, famous cheesesteaks and garlic fries located inside Petco Park during the season. Mission Gorge, Point Loma are their other two locations. You can visit gaglionebros.com to be their entire menu, their addresses, their phone numbers, all that good stuff. All right, let's get first off, you know, the big news, obviously, no Marmazara being called up by the Padres that that move has not been made official yet, as I've seen, but Cano is not going to be on the team anymore after going 0 for 20 in his last 20 at-bats. And Mazzara coming up, so I thought, you know, it's perfect timing here talking to Tim. Tim, what does Nomar bring, and what do you think he will bring to the Padres Major League team after what you've seen so far this year uh, in AAA? Yeah, as you mentioned, the Padres haven't made an official move with Nomar Mazzara. Uh, he hasn't played for El Paso the past couple of games. He was in the dugout. Um, so that potentially would make sense that uh, he could be called up here. So uh, I'm not supposed to break any news here. So I just want to throw out that disclaimer. Um, but in the event he joins the Padres, I think he could have some important at bats for this contending Padres team. He's played in 35 games for El Paso. He reached base in all 35 he has the best batting average in the Pacific Coast League, the best on base percentage. Uh, the coaches just rave about him, his professionalism, his preparation. Um, and by the way, you, you go to his baseball reference page, and he just turned 27. I did a double take when I saw that at the beginning of the season because he has so much big league experience with Texas, with the White Sox, with the Tigers. Um, if you asked me, you know, before I looked into him, I would have guessed he was 29 or 30, but he's only 27. So um, I know in the past that Bob Melvin has stated he really likes platooning. And I think you, you would get a left-handed bat that can get on base a lot. Um, he's a big, strong guy, and he's had some long home runs. I know the, the stat cast says that uh, one day with the Rangers, he had a 500-foot home run in Arlington. Uh, so he has that kind of strength. But it's not as if he's up there, you know, taking these huge cuts, swinging for the fences. He gets on base a lot, some long at bats, hard guy to get out. Um, I would not be surprised to see him stick with the Padres and become a useful player as a pinch hitter, as a platoon in the outfield. Um, and also, you know, good timing for him with the National League having the DH now. I think uh, if he joins the Padres, I wouldn't be surprised to see him DHing. And yeah, you talk about the DH and my next question, uh, you know, about Mazzara a little in that same subject is with Trace Thompson, obviously, when he was called up, had, I think, nine home runs at the time with El Paso. That didn't work out. What do you think is the difference between Thompson and Mazzara in terms of Ma Mazzara's likelier chances of sticking with the team and having success over Trace Thompson? Yeah, if I recall correctly, when Trace Thompson went up, it was due to Will Myers' injury, um, and you had the feeling that Will would be back fairly soon. Um, whereas in this transaction, if in fact Cano is designated, and if in fact they bring up Mazzara, you know, then there's an opening for maybe a longer fit. Um, at the time of that call up, when Trace Thompson was called up, Nomar was banged up and hadn't played in a couple of days. I think that factored into it. Uh, that he wasn't at 100% health. Um, you know, as you've seen over the years, a lot of times players have come up from El Paso and through no fault of their own, it's a brief stint with the Padres just because of the roster numbers, just because somebody comes back or maybe they acquire somebody else. Um, 
So, you know, that's not to say if Trace Thompson ends up with a major league team, I know he's with Toledo and the Tigers organization right now, maybe with a longer stint, he would hit better. So um, I think that was kind of the reason for that call up at the time back in April. And with Mazzara, you know, you mentioned the DH possibility. I know Luke Voigt, uh, has been pretty much the primary DH. He's been struggling. Uh, I mean, he's been better as of late. With Will Myers, I think he's supposed to be in the lineup tonight. But do you see, like, that's an actual possibility of Mazar getting more time in the outfield than Myers? Um, I don't know about more than, but perhaps there's an opportunity for a, a platoon there where – Mazzara plays some right field. Myers plays some right field. Um, I, I'm very curious about that as well. If, in fact, you know, Mazzara is added, as these reports are saying, about how exactly he'll be used. But I think with the DH, there's a lot of possibilities. He could play right field. Uh, he could DH. He could be a pinch hitter where I know, you know, you don't have pinch hitters for the pitcher anymore. But if there's a, a certain right-handed batter due up against a hard-throwing right-handed reliever, maybe you have Mazzara come up and pinch hit. Um so I would, you know, I would doubt he plays right field every day, but beyond that, I think there's a lot of different places you can mix and match. And then uh, some of Mazar's teammates, that's what I want to start with. I know we can obviously get to Abrams and Camposano and guys like that. Um, what are some smaller name guys that, you know, casual fans or fans that don't really follow the minor leagues uh, should maybe pay attention to so far this season? Yeah, there's a couple of those on the El Paso team. Uh, one outfielder that comes to mind is Taylor Colway. He was picked in the 30-something round a couple of years ago, has never been on the prospect list. But out of nowhere, last season had a great year with El Paso, had one of the top three batting averages in the league, got on base a lot, has come back to El Paso this year, and has been outstanding. Uh, he recently had a streak of 30 games reaching base consecutively. He's not going to be someone that hits a 500-foot home run or steals 20 bases. But he's such a tough um, at bat. It reminds me of last season when Brian O'Grady was in El Paso. It's not as if he got on base every time, but even the times that he made outs, it was like nine, ten pitch at bats. He just had such a knowledge of the strike zone, would foul off pitches. And Colway's like that. Um, and it's really a remarkable story. He was a Division three college player up in Wisconsin, a cold weather state. He said he was completely surprised to be drafted. Um, and here he is in AAA and thriving. Uh, he has the second most doubles in the league. He gets on base a lot. And I wouldn't be surprised to see him play his way to the major leagues, whether that's with San Diego or maybe he's the type of guy that stays in AAA this year and gets picked up in a Rule 5 draft or gets traded. Um, and I think another player like that is Matthew Batten, another guy from a cold weather place, Connecticut, another very high round draft pick. Um or low round draft pick, you know, some people say one way or the other. Anyway, the draft number was a high number is what I'm trying to say. Um, and he plays third base, shortstop, second base, left field, center field, first base, has played everywhere except right field and catcher for El Paso, has been with El Paso parts of 19 or most of 19, parts of 18, uh, most of 21, and this year, and has a 300 lifetime batting average in AAA. And, um, has gotten stronger, has really developed some gap power. And I would not be surprised to see him at some point get a shot with the Padres or someone else as a, as a utility player um, who really has improved his hitting. How about Ryan Weathers? I want to ask about him. Obviously, he was on the team last year at the big league level. And then this year, he wasn't going to make the team just because of how much starting pitching they ended up having. And then, you know, you count in Mackenzie Gore becoming Mackenzie Gore. Uh, and not the guy that we saw, you know, last year, really. Um, what's going on with Ryan Weathers? I know I think I saw in his last two appearances, he's combined for 10 runs allowed. What's what's going on there with him? Yeah, I'm looking at the notes here as um, as we speak, and 47 and two-thirds innings and has allowed too many base runners, uh, 21 walks and 67 hits. So 20 more hits than innings. Um, when you look at the StatCast info, the velocity is still there. His fastball last night in Salt Lake City was 95 miles an hour. Um, has a, a slider that he's bouncing in the dirt, and a lot of times it's getting swings and misses. So I think if you were to watch him in isolated innings, 
he looks great. But in the big picture, there's too many base runners allowed there. Um, so I don't know. You know, regrettably, we still have some MLB COVID-19 rules where I'm I really don't uh, go in the clubhouse. So I think in the past I would have been able to ask more questions than that than I have this year. But that's, you know, to be honest, uh, a great mystery. It was, as you described, somebody who was in the mix to make the opening day roster was on the Padres most of last year. By the way, it's still only 22 years old. So we've seen many pitchers over the years in El Paso with slow starts and end up helping the Padres that year. Um, you know, an obvious example of that was 2021 Mackenzie Gore did not pitch well for El Paso and now is perhaps uh, the rookie of the year candidate in the NL here as we speak in June. So um, I would not be surprised if Ryan Weathers helps the Padres this year and in future years. But yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a worthwhile question because this isn't a, a couple of start bump in the road. We are now at June. Um and he's not having a, a great season. What about uh, Yzmero Petit? Obviously, he was brought in. Uh, he pitched under Bob Melvin, had some success uh, in Oakland under Bob Melvin. I thought that he would have been called up already. Um, what's going on with him, and do you know if there's any timeline on that? Well, he didn't join El Paso until May and did not pitch anywhere in April. So his first couple of games got hit hard. Um Understandably, because he didn't have a spring training. And no matter how much side work and gym work you can do, AAA is no joke. You can't just hop in and um, and dominate right away. So he's had some better starts, better appearances, I should say, lately. Um, it was interesting. I saw him talking to El Paso bench coach Robbie Hammock the other day, and they played together with the Diamondbacks um, at a time when Bob Melvin was the manager there. So, you know, Yasmero at age 37 is the oldest player on the Chihuahuas. Um I wouldn't be surprised to see him get a shot in the major league bullpen at some point. And he's pitching a lot better. Um, has a really good curveball. His velocity is increasing. And as you described, he's somebody who's been around the block. I mean, made his major league debut in 2006 for the Florida Marlins, uh, long before they were even called Miami. I mean, this guy was a minor league baseball player in 2003. So that's what I love about AAA is you have Yasmira Petit, and C.J. Abrams. You have players that are, you know, 15, 16 years apart in age. I remember last year watching 44-year-old Joe Bimel pitch to 22-year-old Luis Camposano. Uh, that's the fun variety we get in AAA. Right. Yeah. And um, an, uh, just another update here. Uh, a couple more guys. Castillo, Jose Castillo. I saw that he hasn't given up an earned run yet, uh, I think, in his minor league rehab appearances. And then Denelson Lamette, I know he's not with AAA anymore, but I think he was sent down there, did not pitch there, if I remember correctly. Then he's with AA now. Was, uh, and I think he's gone like three appearances in AA. Just some updates on those two. Yeah, for Lamette, you're right. He did not pitch for El Paso. Um, when a player is put on the Major League Taxi Squad, they are on paperwork put on the AAA roster oftentimes. So while Lamette uh, was on El Paso's roster, he actually didn't physically join the Chihuahuas. Uh, but as you described, he has gone to San Antonio and is pitching there. Um, and I, I wish him the best. He was somebody coming through El Paso in 2017. It was fun to watch him. And of course, was outstanding for the Padres in the 2020 season. Has had those injury troubles. But, um, you know, as you look through the years in El Paso, that season he had in 2020, that might be the best um, pitching season we've ever had from a former Chihuahua as far as what they did in the majors. So um, probably before Mackenzie Gore with what he's doing this year. As far as, um, oh yeah, Jose Castillo. So yeah, he, uh, as you described, had no runs allowed at Lake Elsinore, is building his way back, coming back from injury, is now with the Chihuahuas. Um, and that's an interesting story because you know, he was removed from the Major League 40-man roster, but then re-signs with the Padres on a minor league deal. Oftentimes in that scenario, you'd see a player start anew somewhere else. But it shows how much the player likes the organization and how much they think about him that even though there was sort of that breakup of him being taken off the Major League roster, he comes back and will now try to make it to the Major Leagues again. But he's been outstanding. He's such a presence on the mound. He's what you picture out of a pitcher, six foot six. Um and you think about a left-handed batter stepping in there trying to face him with the different angles that his arm has. Um, he's been outstanding. He's 
probably in May was El Paso's best reliever, probably best pitcher total in the month of May. Uh, and I have no doubt he's somebody the Padres are asking about. Um, I know they already have some solid left-handed relievers in the Major League bullpen, but would not be surprised to see him in San Diego this year. Yeah, because with him, I don't know if you remember this, but I think it was before spring training happened this year, he, I think, told the San Diego media, hey, I have something still left to prove here with the Padres. And that was uh, one of the reasons why he came back. And that would be so cool to, to see him come back and then pitch really, really well with the Padres just because of everything that he has gone through. And it's the same thing with other guys. It's the same thing with Lamette, right? It's been great seeing Gore pitch really well with the Padres because of how much struggles it looked or it seemed like from what we were hearing from what he faced the last two years in 2020 in the alternate site. And then 2021, obviously being with El Paso or even back to spring training, not being able to finish innings, being with El Paso, struggling, going all the way back down to, to the uh, Peoria spring training, just backfields. And now he's with the major league roster. He's the National League Rookie of the Year front runner right now. So just the comeback stories, there's a lot of them, I think, that could happen along with Gore, you know, in this Padres minor league system. Yeah, good points by you there on both. I totally agree. Um, on the Jose Castillo quotes, I remember those articles. And I love that, you know, in an era in sports where understandably players are looking for the best situation for themselves, there really seemed to be some loyalty there with Jose Castillo, what the Padres meant to him, bringing him to the majors. And he wanted to not just reach the majors, but succeed for them. Um, I love that. I remember those quotes as well. And on McKenzie, um, kind of speaking to Padres roving instructors and Padres executives, um, even before his struggles in 2021 in El Paso, they talked about his strength of being competitive. Just uh, whether it was even on a, an extended spring training game when he was younger, he just so desperately wanted to win those games, get that batter. And even with his struggles in El Paso last year, they said that maintained. He was so driven. There never was a woe is me. It was a, a waking up in the morning and just fighting to recapture what he had at Lake Elsinore, that great season he had in the California League. Um, so it was interesting to hear that. You know, they're, they're like all of us, if we had struggles, you know, in our professional lives, there's a temptation to wallow and, um, you know, not be motivated the next day. But it sounds like for him, it was totally the opposite in the summer of 21. Yeah. Um, you know, we can move with uh, to Fernando. I know, obviously, this isn't like an El Paso Chihuahua question, kind of, but he is probably going to go on a rehab assignment, obviously, before he comes back uh, in, you know, late June. Do you have any sense of where he might B, is it going to be double A or Lake Elsinore? Or I know it's up to the Padres, but obviously I, I think you'd love to have him come to triple A. Do you have any sense of where he would be rehabbing? Well, you're right. We would love to see him in triple A. We think he'd look great in a Chihuahua's uniform. Um, we almost got Fernando twice in 2018. Uh, he was at double A. And the whispers were El Paso was in the playoffs in a couple of weeks. And the whispers were that they were going to promote Fernando to AAA for the playoffs, but then he injured his thumb. And if you remember in 18, he didn't finish that San Antonio season. So then at the 20, um, let's see. Yeah, it would have been the 2018 winter meetings. There was a Padres executive and it was nothing official, but they were just saying to me, they said, oh, you're going to have a great El Paso team which we did in 19, but some of the names he rattled off, he said, uh, yeah, you're going to have Josh Naylor who came, Cal Quantrill who was there, you know, Chris Paddock, never happened, and, uh, and, and Tatis. I said, wow. But then as you remember in 2019, he just played so well in spring training, he made the opening day roster. So we just missed Tatis twice. And uh, if he has a rehab assignment, maybe he'll come to El Paso and maybe we'll finally get him. But no, I don't know what affiliate that would be with. I'm not sure if even the Padres do yet. Um, but you're right, he definitely will need a rehab assignment because of how long he's been gone. And typically when a player needs a longer rehab start or a longer rehab uh, stint, they have used El Paso. Um, that's just an unofficial thing I've observed where, you know, if a starter might need just one start, they'll go to Lake Elsinore because it's geographically close. But if a guy needs a week worth of at-bats, 
they'll use El Paso. Uh, a couple of times over the years, we've had Will Myers for a whole series at a time. Or, you know, I'm dating myself now, but when Melvin Upton had that long rehab assignment in 15, mm -hmm. he spent three weeks with El Paso. So I think it's definitely possible, but uh, to be announced where Fernando goes on that rehab assignment. I think he's due to go to El Paso. Um, I think we can agree on that. Um, all right. Moving to Abrams and uh, Campy, obviously. We can start with CJ. He came down. Uh, I think it was pretty clear that he just needed more at-bats at the minor league level. Uh, part of the reason why he was on the big league team was because of just their lack of infield depth. Um, with CJ, I thought that they, when they would send him down, they were going to give him a lot of outfield reps because that felt like that would be the best place for him long term on the Padres major league roster with Tatis at short and Manny at third and Cronenworth at second and Hosmer probably not going to get traded at first. That just felt like the right spot for him in somewhere in the outfield, whether that's center or a corner. So I saw that he started in center was it over the weekend, but other than that, it's pretty much been middle infield. Why? I think that the plan is that he will play more outfield over time. I think that they probably wanted him to get settled. His first couple of games, he played shortstop, then shifted over to second base. Jared Sandberg, the Chihuahua's manager, has told me that something he developed with the Rays organization, or at least something the Rays organization did when he was managing there, was he liked a couple days in a row at each position. So Eggy Rosario, for example, is playing third base, shortstop, and second. But for the most part, he's playing two games at a time at each uh, Jared likes that more innings reacting one game to the next based on that same vantage point. So I think over time you'll see CJ playing more outfield. Uh, as you described, he played over the weekend in El Paso, one game in center field. There was one ball with a tough sky in the twilight that he couldn't find it and it landed over his head. But other than that, he looked comfortable chasing down fly balls. Obviously he has a strong arm. And it's been fun to watch him play. When you see him up close, he's, uh, you know, thin and wiry and yet so much bat speed. Um, has hit a couple of long home runs for El Paso. So it, it's interesting to see how much sock he has kind of for a thinner guy. Um, and another guy, it's amazing to think at his age, you know, he's the age of a college baseball player, and here right. he is being sent down to the Chihuahuas. It's like he came down from the majors and became the youngest player on the AAA team. Mm -hmm. um, you know, people don't often recognize that, how few 21-year-olds there are in AAA games. So it's been fun to watch him play. Yeah, and then uh, last one here with Luis Camposano. Um, he's, when he was sent, or he was with AAA, then came up for like 12 at-bats or something, like nothing pretty much, and then came back down to AAA, and he's hit well based on the stats that I've seen. My question to you is, why do the Padres just keep sending him down, and when they do send him up, it's not for a very long period of time. Like, he's not getting consistent at bats at the major league level even though cons you know he's playing well consistently at least offensively at the minor league level yeah based on uh my twitter feed and uh, some messages i get that that question's starting to come up more because austin nola is not having a great offensive season right. um and luis is hitting well here he has a 400 on base percentage um, I know in the afternoons, if you watch, he's really working with people on blocking balls. If you read about his background, he wasn't somebody that was a catcher all the way through childhood. He didn't catch as many innings in high school. So he's, you know, even though he's in AAA and has major league experience, he's still learning the art of catching. Um, you know, a scout one time told me that he feels Luis physically is ready, offensively is ready, but this one particular scout's thought was that maybe a few um, balls are getting past him. He's improved a lot on blocking, but but that was kind of the one aspect of his game, according to this scout with another team, that uh, Luis is still working on is the blocking. So he's another player. He's only 23, already has played parts of a couple seasons in the majors. Um, I think, you know, understandably, there's also a clamor for prospects to get up but as you've seen over the years, you don't want to send a guy back down after becoming a, a starting player. Um, I'm dating myself, but I remember in 2011 when Anthony Rizzo was just crushing it in AAA Tucson, there was such a clamor for him to get up. And 
I think at the time, Jed Hoyer admitted that maybe they brought him up a little too soon. He didn't hit well in June, had to send him back. So I think in general, if, if you're going to give a guy a lot of playing time, maybe it's better to be patient like the Padres are doing and just really make sure you're getting the best version of the player when they come up. Like offensively, at bat wise, you talk about giving guys that amount, specific amount of time or whatever to be ready and make sure that they're ready. Is there a number that you've seen over the years with these young prospects that the Padres want them to get to for them to feel comfortable to permanently bring them up? I've, I've liked talking to AAA managers about that exact thing. And what I've heard is they look at situations. In AAA, you're getting not just the hard-throwing prospects, but also veteran guys. We talked about Yasmero Petit. They want to see a young hitter hang in there against a Yasmero Petit, who's 37 years old and has faced thousands of batters in his life. Um, how do they handle that? You know, can they, do they take that pitch that is a close ball? Or are they anticipating what's coming up next when they're behind in the count? I think they're really studying situations. Um, the Padres do this really cool thing that Jared Sandberg, uh, El Paso's manager, was telling me about, where uh, they do tracking in the afternoon. If a pitcher is throwing a side session, it used to be in the bullpen, but now they'll do it on the mound in the afternoon before batting practice. And they'll have a batter stand in there, not to take swings, but to stand in there with their regular stance and then say ball or strike on what they saw. And then the software confirms if they were right or not. So the player that I heard really improved his game last year was Jose Azucar doing that at both double A AA and triple A. When Azucar was coming up with the Tigers and then when he was with San Antonio and El Paso, apparently the Padres, understandably, loved everything about his game except his chase rate. He was going after balls. And they said those afternoon tracking sessions just made him identify what is a strike so much more clearly. And he showed up to spring training, had a great spring training, and now he's holding his own in the majors. Uh, which, by the way, that, that's a great story. If you and I were taping this interview a year or two ago, he might not even be a name that came up. He was not a big prospect, but just played so well late in the year in AAA last year uh, that he earned that invite to Major League Spring Training, thrived there, and here we are in June, and he's still in the majors. It's a great story. So uh, anyway, I know that was a long answer, but I think not necessarily number of at-bats, but the situations within those at-bats, I think, is what the Padres are looking for. Perfect answer. I love that. That that's I did not know about the – I mean, you always hear about Lake Snell's throwing a bullpen or something, and someone just stands there tracking. But to do it at the minor leagues and have a specific example like that with the Zokar, uh, you know, improve that. And now you look at what he's doing at the major league level. I mean, last week I was arguing that Azokar should be getting more at-bats than Grisham. That's just how much it seems like that he's uh, progressed. So, yeah, that's a definitely a uh, great story. And this has been a fun uh, conversation, Tim. Thank you so much for doing this. Yeah, thank you, Ben. All right, this has been episode 176 of the Talking Fires podcast and YouTube show presented by Gaglion Bros, famous cheesesteaks and garlic fries. I'm Ben Fadden, your host. I'll be back for the pregame show. Padres Brewers kicks off later today. First of four games, Padres trying to end their three-game losing streak. All right, see you, everybody.